All right, good afternoon, everyone. I am very happy and excited to see you all here, especially because this, uh, uh, this is gonna be the first time that we do the demo day here on campus. So we're very excited to have you here so you can know the facilities, the staff, and of course, this group of students who are going to present their portfolio project that is the culmination of the program, right? Um, we're gonna have the first student graduating from specialization, which is also uh, something new for us and we're excited about it. And it's, it's, I feel excited about it because I was once part of the school and now being on this side, teaching them and supporting them throughout this journey is very gratifying for me because I love teaching. Um, and you will be asking why a portfolio project is so important. Well, it serves several different purposes, right? Um, it highlights a student's unique uh, interests and background when networking or maybe interviewing with potential employers. Also, it provides a realistic workplace scenario where engineers create a solution to fit loosely defined uh, requirements. They break this down into concrete tasks and implement them in a, on a deadline. Also, it allows for, for self-directed learning to explore new technical concepts, um, also deepen the understanding of a curriculum cover topic or use technology to bring an idea to life. Okay, so before I keep talking about myself, I'm going to tell you how uh, this, the event is going to go. I'm going to be presenting each team. And then at the end of the presentation, I'm going to open the mic so that um, if you have questions here or in the back, you can ask the, the team and they will uh, give you answers about the projects. Okay, and then we're going to keep going until everyone has presented. And then we'll go to a ceremony and deliver the certificates. Okay. So that's how we're gonna roll today. I'm gonna grab the second. We have a group, um, a team of females, right? Uh, and this is very cool because usually um, this field is, uh, has a lot of you know, male power, but she, they are representing you know, a new generation of women who are interested in technology and apply them to our everyday life, okay? So to present us, drink up, we have Ivanska, Angeira, and Sarah. Please come on to the front. My name is Ivanska Rodriguez Sanabria. I was a former art student at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras campus. Before coming to Holberton, I was looking at how I can combine my artistic and my creative side into the technology world. And that's how I stumbled upon front end. And with the experience that I gained throughout this whole project, I plan on becoming a full stack developer. Hello, everybody. To get to know, to know me, my name is Sara Cruz Marquez. Uh, my background uh, was I worked in the hotel industry for the last five years, uh, both Hilton and Marriott franchises. Uh, that gave me uh, customer direct uh, knowledge. I have to work with them every day and really get to hear them and find out what they needed. Uh, in my technical uh, background, I've uh, studied for a bachelor's in computer science. In the middle of that, I've learn about Holberton and their project-based uh, curriculum, and it really resonated with me. So since I began the journey, I've learned a lot of technical skills that I believe will give me an advantage for my future, future employment. Hello, uh, thank you for coming for this special moment for us. My name is Angela Aquiles, and I have a, a bachelor's degree at marketing and accounting. And um, I also, I am a swim instructor and uh, I have also worked as a customer service at Pax Experience at Banco Popular. And what was my inspiration in coding, you ask? So I started, my motivation was my students because I'm a, a techno, uh, technical uh, uh, teacher. And my students inspired me to start coding because they didn't know about coding. So I want to teach them to code. So uh, Hoverton has gave me that chance to start up as uh, a coding and to, to experience here this journey. And uh, here I believe that I could be a software engineer. And here it has been a great experience. I have been into interviews and I have uh, uh, connect with companies uh, and it has been great. Behind your cup, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, our inspiration. So what was our inspiration? With my background as a bartender, I can give the insight of what were the key questions you ask a client so that you can every time have their perfect drink. Uh, 
this idea was of value because uh, when we were in a research area, we found out that all of the drink generators uh, were catered to people with previous knowledge. You have to know the drink's name, their recipe, or the ingredients. And that gives me to my next point, which is who is our targeted audience? That's simple, it's everybody. You don't have to have any previous knowledge, just your personal preferences. Uh, we've all been in that situation where the, where you're in a bar, uh, you're in a restaurant and it's too crowded. Uh, that doesn't give you the ability to have that personal connection with the bartender so that you can get that special drink even if you don't know anything about that. So that brings us to our minimum viable product which is a web app that you have two filters. You can select each of the filters and then bring back a name of a drink with the picture so you can ask for it at a bar and have that drink on the palm of your hands. Those two filters are, we selected the, their favorite spirits. So you have vodka, gin, uh, rum, whiskey, and tequila. And for the preferences, we selected sweet, spicy, salty, bitter, and sour. How did we make this possible? Over here, I'm gonna show you a picture of the architecture of our web app. Uh, really, the design was the priority, it was, uh, so it was user-friendly. Uh, we have an HTML page that has a form. That form is the one that saves the user input. Uh, that user input goes through a part of a function that has 25 options because it's five for each uh, spirit. It is uh, coded, so the drink, the cocktail name goes through the API that then brings back to the user interface the name of the drink, the photo of the cocktail, the ingredients and its measurements. This is all hosted in Firebase. And uh, we have the security component, uh, which is a pop-up that asks the user if they're 18 years older so that they can access the web app. We also included a randomized component when if you don't want to make each a selectment, you can just click that random button and it will give you a random cocktail to order from. Now I'm gonna talk about, mention the, the technologies that we use. For the back end, we have Firebase for hosting. We have an API that we found, the name is CocktailDB and uh, JavaScript for the back end. For the front end, we use HTML, CSS, uh, Bootstrap as a framework, and JavaScript too. Right now, I'm gonna show you a few uh, screen codes of the code that we actually made so that you can see how the data is collected. Uh, one more. As you can see here, we take the parameters from the URL so we save them in two different uh, variables, then make the collection. Uh, then each, uh, each of the spirit and preference is together. So you can see it has a drink name that I selected for you guys. So that's what's gonna show up. And then the name of the drink is sent to the API. So after a user has clicked on, on the cocktail me button, here's when the, the data is collected and we use an API which it connects the back end to the front end. So when we uh, cache the information, we send a result and the result will be our cocktail recipe, which is in a HTML file. The HTML file will um, uh, be at the elements of the recipe. The elements of the recipe will be the ingredients, the image, and also um, uh, the measurements. Here's a bit of the code snippet for the front end, specifically on the Meteor cores to make the site responsive, specifically more for a mobile version since it's a web app, you can easily see it on your phone and it, everything flows right through. So let's see how it is works. We can open a browser and we can type out our URL um, page. We can see we have a simple uh, friendly user with our pop-up, which it says if I'm under and over 18, you click on that I'm over 18. And you can see the simple instruction. We had the two buttons when I explained the first one, cocktail me, which give us uh, two uh, 
choice. You can, the first step, sorry, you can choose from your spirit, I choose vodka. And then the second step, you can choose your palette preference, which is bitter. Then you click on the submit button and it gives you your awesome uh, recipe with the um, ingredients and the measurement. You can go back and you have the other button, which is the random. If you undecide it, you don't, you don't know what which drink to choose. So it gives you that drink. So we have there also a, our drink, which also has the ingredients and the measurements. Then you go back home and we also created another chat with the about, uh, about us, which explains to us why to use a uh, drink cup. These are the top reasons to uh, experience this awesome uh, web page. Then we have our contact, which we use uh, with the front end when you want to contact or have any suggestion is front end. And then we use, as uh, you can see, our meet the team, which uh, we is our team. And if you hover on each picture, you can see that we can connect with each of us. We have GitHub and LinkedIn. So you can click on home again and there's our awesome app. So, how was our process in these three weeks and the tools that we use? First, our first week, we did research in our MVP, which we look for the internet for inspirational uh, websites that are about cocktails. Then our uh, uh, our, in the first week, sorry, we use Firebase. Firebase is a free uh, framework and we created those um, uh, collect data from uh, using a JavaScript file. And second week, we managed our data. We completed our MVP. And the last week, we was designing our uh, app with using HTML, CSS, and Bootstrap. The tools that we use for this project, we use Trello, which uh, help us organize our task and help us guide us to which uh, projects we had to do first. So we had the time to do it at the three weeks. Then we use Discord to meet up. We share our links and share ideas at Discord. We use uh, GitHub to collaborate. We created different branches so we can e each of us uh, collect our uh, code. And then we use Google Slides so, so we can brainstorm our ideas and each other can implement their ideas in a project. The challenges that we overcame throughout this whole week were we, we faced a few of, the, of them, which includes the hosting of the Firebase that we had trouble connecting it with the HTML and the CSS files and Jada and Sara wearing it on like a week so that they could make it running. Then it was working on the tight schedule to meet a deadline then it was on the front end side, making everything responsive and making everything mobile friendly and user friendly. And then it was connecting the back end with the front end using the API, which was an open source API that we used. What we learned throughout the whole process, I learned more about front end. I learned more about how our JavaScript functions work within our dynamic site, how our APIs work and how we integrating into the site and how to work on a tight schedule to meet a deadline and to be able to deliver a finished product. What I learned about this process uh, was every, to apply everything that my previous projects uh, gave me. Uh, we had a final project and we did it from uh, zero. Uh, also uh, with our schedule, we had a really uh, tight schedule. We each knew what to do, but sometimes things don't work out. And at, for example, as a, at the beginning of this project, we were thinking about the data collection using the database that Firebase provides you. Uh, we were, spent too much time trying to figure that out. It wasn't working for us, but then we uh, decided to change up, give us a day to figure it out, if, and we didn't. So we changed the idea of how we were collecting the data and made it work. So what I, what I learned in this project is that I created something, we created something from start to end. 
uh, that can be useful for our customer. We have to learn new technologies and we also had to implement those that we learn at Holberton. So we have also tried to collaborate. We learned our work team uh, collaboration. So we had to listen to each other's ideas and we had to implement those ideas. We also uh, learned how to solve our problems. Like Sara said, we had to choose some technologies, which one were uh, good for our project because of the time management. The future updates for DrinkUp includes managing a better database and creating our own API. Since the API that we used was an open source one, it didn't really give us much freedom to make the drinks custom and make the measurements correct. And so then we want to create a profile so that you can save all of your drinks all in one place and be able to have it more and just on a click of a button. Here is our QR code so you can connect with us on LinkedIn so that you can see us more on um, our experience. That's the final of our presentations. Thank you guys for watching yes. and if you have any questions. For and us. also, we have a surprise for you guys. Uh, someone is going to share, uh, give us from Drink Up <laughs> a coaster so you can use it for everyone. <laughs> I love this. Se escucha. Se escucha. Sí. Sí. I love this team going above and beyond. They decided to make their own custom coasters to give it out. Um, so let's start with the judges that we invited. Um, their feedback is very important for us because it helps us grow and, of course, improve those areas um, to make better presentations and, of course, deliver better content. So I'm going to start with you here and then we can pass the microphone along. If you have any questions, go ahead. First of all, congratulations. Excellent job. Um, give, me, give me a second. Let me check if it's on. Hello, hello, hello. Hi. There you go. There you go. First of all, uh, congratulations to all. Excellent job. Um, it uh, seems like an excellent idea. Um, I just have one question. I, I know that you guys specified that you were using uh, Firebase and JavaScript as, a, as, as the test tech stack uh, based on the time constraints. Uh, if, if, if you have more time, uh, have you uh, considered reusing the same tech stack or, or uh, do you think you can have something else? And, and if so, which one? If I had more time, I would include React since React is one of the frameworks that is most um, that most people are like wanting to be able to have in the industry. So if I would have more time, I would include React for the site, and I guess still using Firebase since it was like a better for us specifically. It worked better for us. Uh, I would still be using Firebase, but implemented in a database. So. Uh, that part that uh, we really, uh, make it work. If we had much time, we could all, all do it and do a profile for the for people that use our application. Okay. Do you want to? <laughs> I share the same ideas on my girls. Uh, we have, we would like to use React. Um, and also we would like to lose uh, Firebase because we, we really did a, a, a research, so we will add some user profile. So each one, when enters our application, can create your own profile, and then we can add that Firebase database. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, congrats. Um, I also went through a boot camp, so I know this kind of project is extremely stressful, but very, very fun. Um, I hope you all had a lot of fun learning all these things. Um, I know it kind of showed, you know, the design was very pretty and, you know, the interactions between you. Um, so my question is, uh, did, what, while building and designing specifically more, um, the front end or more specifically, um, did you have accessibility in mind? And if so, um, how'd you go about it? And what uh, updates or upgrades you could do so this could be used by um, different types of people? Since I was in charge of the front end, I did basically think of like 
since the colors of everything because since I was in, from a, my background is from an art major, like I wanted to the colors be not so popful, but at the same time be calming the user interface. And um, I guess the upgrades that I would do, like better like sorting of the buttons, like the nav bar navigation. So it would be even more like user friendly, basically. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, first of all, can, can everybody hear me if this is not working? Turn it on, turn it on again. Hi. Yeah. Test? Yeah. Test? Yeah. yeah. All right. I speak loud anyway. I think I can get away with this. So um, first of all, congrats. Amazing job. Great job on the front end. You have a good sense of style. And I think the sizing was, was uh, of everything was very proper, uh, which it's very important if you want to bring in customers in the door, you got to make it sexy, right? Yeah. So uh, I'll ask a question, not as technical. And uh, how how would you? So you like this? You got some things that you're gonna do next? Uh, did you put any thought as to how you would monetize this? How would you take this to the next level and make something out of it, if you were to, at all? I guess you could say like maybe in, in including like the service industry, specifically maybe in hotels and local tourist areas so it could be more accessible to people. And if, since you wanna monetize it so that they also could bring in more money from their side also. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my idea is uh, innovation. So if you go to a restaurant right now, you have the menu and you have your selections, maybe in the future, you can have a menu in this kind of form where you just put the preference of uh, the protein, what you like, what you don't like, so that it can already choose a plate for you. So that's what you buy because in the in the restaurant industry, you have a lot of problems with people not liking a certain, a certain place because they don't understand the ingredients that are in that plate. So maybe if you cater that, so it will be more easy for them to put what they like and you just give them a plate and then they buy it and they like it. So I really would like to add some reviews so people can watch the review because here in Puerto Rico, we like to look for other people's review. So I think that could be uh, monetized. And, and yeah, I think about giving the application to restaurants on the area where there's a lot of hotels when there's a bar and it could be great to monetize that. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Oh, sure. Um, just in case, here we have a QR code. You can scan it and that will take you to their web app, to their web oh, app yes. and you can test it yourself in your phone, okay? You can use that on your mobile. I have a question from someone who's viewing through Zoom. Welcome everybody who's on the Zoom call. Uh, it's from, uh, let me read this. It's uh, from Natalia Cebollero. She says, I love the female empowerment of this group, beautiful style and colors. Now she has this question, says, how will you go about people that don't drink alcohol and yet want the experience? Have you thought about that? Maybe mocktail options? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you can add more filters to the options. So we have right now two, and we have only five options for the spirit sides that can expand. You can divide uh, whiskey for scotch or rye and then have a lot of more options. So you can include in that, in the same spirit side, a non-alcoholic so that it can bring you back the special drink for you, non-alcoholic. Yeah. No, that was the only question. Uh, thanks, for answering. thanks for answering. Love it. Okay. So no more questions in the chat, right? No. Okay. No so we're good with the questions. Um, the, let's give him another applause before we move on. Oh, okay. So, okay. Re let's rewind back. Sorry for that. Uh, the API is called CocktailDB. It uh, 
saves in a JSON file all of the ingredients, the picture, the name of the cocktail. It also has its uh, procedures, which has been included in this part of our project, but is open. So the majority of the recipes are from all over the world. Uh, we had uh, uh, also the measurements uh, problem with that because it, it, some measurements were in centiliter and nobody here uses that, so yeah. Super, thank you. Okay, now let's give an applause. <laughs> so I felt kind of identified uh, with their inspiration because I was a bartender myself before I got into the tech industry and seeing how you can play with technologies and do so things like this is so interesting, right? Um, so I thank you girls for presenting us drink up. Now let's go for our second team. Now the second team is bringing something different because they made a video game, okay? So to present us uh, star, star Momentum. <laughs> star Momentum, let's welcome here in the front are Raymond, Jaime and Victor. Well, first of all, uh, good afternoon. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I'm going to be presenting to you, me and my team, uh, Star Momentum, a retro 2D game that we made with much love. As Jeffrey already introduced us, my name is Raymond Colon. Uh, I am from Caguas, Puerto Rico. Uh, I started uh, with a bachelor's degree in psychology and ended up all the way here. Uh, I went through college and then uh, spent, like Sarah here, a lot of time in the hotel industry. And I realized that, that it wasn't for me and that why my first love was technology. And most importantly, software. Uh, ever since I was a little kid, I've been think tinkering with computers, uh, you know, messing up with uh, making Windows into, uh, into Mac and siloing uh, uh, custom rooms to my Android phone and stuff like that. And I always wanted to, to do something like this. Uh, thank you very much, Holberton, for introducing me. Uh, gave me the chance. Hello, hello. Now, hello, everyone. My name is Jaime Diaz. I am 19 years old. Um, I am from Atillo, Puerto Rico. Um, I started studying computer science in University of Puerto Rico in Bayamon. That didn't work out really that well for me, but luckily I found this path that is Holberton, which really saved my life and gave me more aspiration to keep studying software engineering and coding in general. I am the second developer of the team and UI designer of the game. Greetings, my name is Victor Samuel Cruz Marrero from Sierra Bayamon, Puerto Rico. Uh, I am the web designer and tester for the game Star Momentum for, for my background. I always enjoyed video games since I was a kid and I always wanted to, exp to check out the magic of how to make one. So when, so when I was a teenager, I was, I was obsessed with God of War and I saw the behind the scenes and that, and that sparked the idea of studying video game design. So I started video game designing in Universidad Interamericana Recinto de Bayamón, there, it was okay, but I wanted to learn, I wanted more about it. So I, be, so I heard about Oberholberton School, so I came to, uh, to expand my knowledge. All right, so uh, here on screen, yeah, you're going to see some of our, uh, of our inspiration. Uh, you might recognize some of these games, They're, they are pretty iconic. Uh, they're pretty old uh, by our standards, but they, uh, are amazing uh, because they are uh, simple, they're fun, they're engaging, and they capture a time in gaming uh, where everything was, you know, more uh, player focused. Uh, we wanted to capture uh, that nostalgia and that like retro look uh, in our game, and we wanted to bring it to a modern audience. So that's why we did it. So as Raymond said, this game was inspired mostly of of asteroids, but we have Galaga and Space Invaders, which basically inspired us and motivated us to implement some of the movement that you might know from these games to implement to ours. Me personally, I was inspired to do a game because I come from a family of gamers and that have implemented in me a lot of games and since very little. So I decided to say, why not make a game? 
where my inspiration was actually watching video games from the genre shoot em ups for the arcade feel and you know, and and for the and for the lunch project i decided to make a video game and and i and i see that we, my companions had the same inspiration so we joined and we started working on it All right, so here's some of the technology that we use for this game. Uh, we made the game with Unity. It's uh, basically one of the industry standard uh, video game engines alongside with Unreal. Uh, Unity is a very powerful engine uh, with a lot of tools. Um, we didn't utilize uh, a lot of them uh, because that game is able that Unity is able to make like full 3D games and we made a 2D game. Uh, but it was a challenge uh, to work with Unity, and that's something that we wanted to do um, because it, it allowed us to make the game exactly how we wanted to. That, that being said, that it was challenging, we decided to use it because we wanted to be challenged and put ourselves to the task. With that being said, we had to learn the language tied with Unity Engine that is C-sharp. We have to implement our framework here from Holberton to our project and implement and learn the language that is C-sharp from scratch and make our game. And for the landing page, we use the Bootstrap Toolkit for the front end to make it more easier for the, mo for the mobile display. I also used HTML for the language. And to deploy it, we also we used GitHub Pages. And to deploy the set game, we use also the website called itch.io. All right, so uh, next are going to be some code snippets of the game, uh, exact, um, showing us how it works. And Jaime will introduce us to the Asteroid script. So as we can see right here, we are having the Asteroid script encoded in C-sharp language. Okay, so we can hear we have our variables and then that are tied to our Unity engine. Um, then we move on to the awake function, which basically is getting the component from the Unity engine, its rigidness and renderedness for the asteroid itself. Then we're moving to the start function, which basically is taking the asteroid itself putting it its mass and size and its direction of where it will be spawning. And then we move to the update function, which basically is just destroying the asteroid when it's past bounds. Okay, so here we see the deploy asteroid uh, script. Uh, it, this is the script responsible for actually launching the asteroids and spawning them. Uh, we are using a procedural generation so that the asteroids are always different. Uh, this uh, script right here, uh, this function right here called spawn asteroids. Uh, takes a, a, a variance of angle and it makes it, you know, uh, make a sun asteroid spawn alongside a y axis with a random uh, rotation, uh, a random mass, and uh, a random position in, along that y axis. And then it instantiates that uh, asteroid uh, with this coroutine right here called asteroid wave. Uh, which waits for a total of 0 0.3 seconds and then responds a new asteroid. Uh, after a certain amount of activations are done, uh, you get the energy deployment, uh, which is the energy replenishment that we use uh, for a player. Here you can see a sample from the web page in the section in, in the container in play. You can go to, you can click on the link in the iframe, which is a, which is a, which is a nice, beautiful button. It's very, very good. And in the, con and the contact, I made a table with, with, our, with our names. We also with links with, with, Git, with, with our GitHubs and with our LinkedIn's. So now that we talked about a little bit of code, now we're gonna talk about our timeline for this project. On week one, we did a lot of brainstorming, gathering up, gathering up a lot of ideas, talking to each other, seeing what's gonna work for us. Then on week two, we did a lot of research. We were researching which game engine we were going to use. We decided obviously to use Unity. Then we moved into week three, which was the MVP design of the game. 
and week four, we have the, the version 0 0.1 and 1.0, which basically were the last two versions that we made of the game. And week five, we published the game online on the website called itch.io. For the challenges, not on technical, we had a little problem with communication, also with time availability and time management. You know, we had so we we, had, we sometimes we didn't we couldn't connect to communicate with each other, but sometimes we had some car problems and couldn't be available to reunite in the in the in the school. But however, even though we had those challenges, we we managed to make the game at at, at the right time. All right, for some of our technical challenges, uh, first we have to start with working with Unity. Uh, here you can see a screenshot of the Unity editor right there. Uh, it's kind of clunky, as you might know. Uh, it, so it has a lot of uh, variability and it's very uh, hard to learn, uh, but there's a lot of resources online that you can leverage. Uh, so we did that and I think it worked out great for us. Uh, another of the issues that we had was with version control. We use uh, GitHub and Git for version control. And yeah, GitHub doesn't play very nice with Unity files. They tend to be rather large, uh, even though our game is a 2D game. Uh, so we had to find some clever solutions to make it work, but um, it actually worked great. Uh, learning any old language is always a challenge, but uh, C Sharp, uh, you know, is pretty similar to C, and we learned that in school. Uh, so it, I think it's a mixture of C and Python, but don't, don't tell anyone that. Um, game debugging, there were some things that were uh, broken, uh, especially the energy meter that you're going to see in the game, uh, making it so that it linked with the movement of the player and that it replenishes with the asteroid was a real uh, challenge. Okay, so what did we learn? Um, me personally, what I learned was that I really enjoy game development. It's very rewarding when you can play and enjoy something that you made, uh, that, that you and your team made with your own hands. And it, it's very challenging. Uh, I learned a lot about cooperation and collaboration and working with a team uh, under pressure under pressure to meet a deadline. Uh, and I think that was crucial. And yes, that's an experience that I'm going to take with me for sure. So what I learned personally in this process of making this game was that I really enjoy being in a group of guys that are motivated to make this game or make every project available. I learned to make a game from scratch. I learned how to work with Unity. I learned how to basically learn C Sharp and implement coding into making this game. Um, I learned that I can be more efficient and be more available to my team and be there to help them even more in what comes to coding and being here to make everything possible on time. What I learned is that the Hoberton way is an amazing way to learn and to learn and relearn some coding and, and communication is also key when working on a team. And there's a, there are amazing ways to get, to get connected, like Trello, when you're doing projects and stuff. All right. So, so now we're going to have our demo for the game. I'm going to be explaining to you guys what's happening and how does it work. Yes, you. Um, can you... Anyways, so as we can see, here is the game interface. We are having the player moving, which basically the controls are W key or S key, or in other cases, up arrow and down arrow. We can have our lives meter or energy bar right at the bottom. As you can see, we just triggered an energy asteroid, which basically replenished some of the energy to our bar. We're moving and we have our scoring, which basically is endless. Until you lose, it will not stop. Basically what you can expect is when the energy bar is basically at zero, you're gonna lose because the point of this game is the most minimal movement possible. If you move more, the energy will deplete. 
And if your lives run out, you will lose. As you can see, we grabbed another energy asteroid and our energy replenished. Here we have our game over UI, our press enter to play again, and our high score is shown. So yeah, uh, actually the game has a really nice soundtrack. I was pretty, really proud of that. Just couldn't, couldn't listen to it. Yeah. Uh, we did take that into consideration. It's a, it's a, I think it's a really catchy, but you can hear it. Uh, so some future upgrades that we will uh, plan to implement if we have more time, of course. Uh, first of all, I wanted to add a shooting feature. I mean, it's nice dodging asteroids and all, but uh, you know, sometimes you just want to like destroy asteroids. And, I think uh, you know it's something that we could implement. Uh, so it's not on our list. Uh, make it mobile compatible. Right now, the game is hosted on itch.io, and you can play it as long as you are on a computer. Uh, but it does not work on mobile uh, because WebGL, uh, the technology that we use to deploy the game and publish the game, does not support mobile. And in order to deploy it with mobile, you will have to use you know subscribe to different app stores and publish on mobile. Uh, so that's something to take into consideration. Uh, customization, maybe customize the shape, different con uh, different colors. Um, that's something that we would like. And a global leaderboard so that you can compare high scores uh, uh, with other people around the globe. That would be nice. Okay, so right there is the game link. Uh, you can uh, you can visit it. Uh, and you can go directly to the web page and it, uh, it will have a link to the game. And if you have a PC or a Mac or even a, I think if you have an iPad, an iPad with a keyboard, you can play it. Uh, it's pretty fun uh, and enjoy. All right, uh, can you hear me? My push off, see? Okay, super. Well, thank you. Let's go for a round of questions from the panel. Let's we'll start here. Well, hi. hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, once again, uh, excellent job. Uh, congratulations. Um, thank you. Sometimes this type of um, teamwork it's challenging uh, when when you know, we, when we're trying to tackle some technology uh, problems uh, as a, as a as a team. Uh, you mentioned struggles about communication. Uh, can you tell us uh, what type of strategy did you use for oh, going around that communication issue and 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 and, and making the th things happen like you did uh, in the short amount of time that you had? So I'm going to let all my team may speak, uh, but for one, um, the issue that we had with version control was one of the big issues that it, 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 it hindered communication because at first we didn't have a version of the game that, that they could edit remotely at the beginning from GitHub because we couldn't just integrate it. Uh, so we were working all from one computer, uh, but after we did, uh, we managed to try to make time and, and everyone had a version of the game that they were working. And I think that was crucial, at least, uh, you, you know, with the version control and using GitHub to know what the other person was doing, uh, you know, uh, frequent uh, meetings uh, with using Discord and, and, you know, just being here as, as much as we could. Um, so um, answering your question, the most the, the thing we did to solve this problem of communication and time management was that when some of us were not able to come here at school or meet up in Discord, we really just said, we have to make this, we have to step up, we have to appear. I called everybody, they called everybody, and we basically got our foots to the ground and said, we have to make this. There's no time for, you know, if your car, got shut down, taken over, I don't know, maybe find some other sources to appear and get this done. We face some problems with the game on some features, but we, with putting in the time and sticking together in calls till 
endless nights, we basically got it done. Thank you. Hi, I'm impressed you all taught yourself C sharp. Uh, <laughs> um, the whole reason I became a software engineer was because I had an idea for a 2D video game um, and I was going to build it. Or I started building it using Unity. But um, back then, I was a mechanical engineer. And I didn't know anything about coding. So the coding part was done by a friend. Um, five years later, I'm a software engineer, and I still don't know C Sharp. <laughs> um, so if you were to, so you mentioned that Unity was like a, like, um, a big program for such a simple mm -hmm. game. Um, and yeah, I had the same situation happen to me. Um, what other technologies would you consider learning or using maybe with the skills you already have that would make this simpler? Well, uh, while we were, uh, you know, brainstorming and uh, doing our research, uh, we came ag uh, across several different game engines. Uh, the most prominent uh, was Game Maker. Uh, with Game Maker, you can make this game without any code at all. Okay, uh, something that that there are tools that you can use that don't require any code, and you can make a game, you know, in a day or two. Uh, but that's, I don't think that was like the point. We wanted to teach ourselves that's part of the experience. Uh, you know, we wanted to to learn C Sharp because we thought that uh, with a base in C, we would be able to, you know, to leverage that and and, and, and understand um, better. The Game Maker uses its own uh, coding language called GL, uh, GML, and it's completely different. And even though it was seemingly simpler, there's a lot of the underlying structure, like with uh, Unity, you can control every single aspect of the game. Uh, it's kind of like if you want to compare it to like programming languages, it's like comparing like C with Python. Like you, you have to control everything with C, but with Python, there's a lot that goes in the background that you don't know what's going, what, what's happening. So, uh, um, just as a suggestion or things that I have considered myself, um, there's Canvas that you can use with your own web development skills. Um, and um, well, in my case, I was building a mobile game. So, and I became an iOS engineer at some point. And I thought, you know, building a game in Swift uh, is not as hard as Unity. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you so much. I'm definitely keeping my own notes <laughs> and learning from you. Um, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like to echo amazing job, very nicely done, uh, very, very impressive and a huge undertaking. You guys are brave. Um, tell me a little bit about your uh, quality process. So our quality process, yeah, it was, basically a lot of testing. We were trying to make some things fast and we were hit against the wall some of the most of the times because it wasn't running or it wasn't working as it should have or as we envisioned it in. That being said, that's why Unity was so finicky and so hard to work with because we wanted to make some things that didn't work out. Like for example, we were using the, we were implementing our energy bar and the, our energy bar wasn't working and wasn't replenishing the asteroids. We needed to find out how to make the player trigger the asteroid without going backwards and go behind the bounds, you know? Also with the issues with the energy pickups, that sometimes appeared inside the asteroids. It was kind of an issue trying to get a power up. But as a quality as quality goes, or we just basically stayed endless nights working in, on every single task. We were aware that we needed to do the little things first to make it efficient and make it work uh, step by step. But we were just playing and testing and coding and testing and coding and testing once and, and again and again and again. So uh, just to expand upon my uh, my teammates' uh, answer, uh, 
there were so many things that we wanted to do with the game that we weren't, were not able to do. First of all, it was going to have a different name. It was going to be called Infinite Atzel. It was going to be about, uh, you know, the, the whole dodging asteroid mechanics was always going to be there. Uh, but we wanted the asteroids to accelerate infinitely, which is not simple uh, because every asteroid, as you saw, is generated, uh, you know, randomly using procedural generation and every game object is separate. So to, in order to accelerate all those asteroids that are already in the scene in Unity, you will have to get a reference to each and every one of them and accelerate each one individually and then do it again and again until the idea was that the more you accelerate, the more you run out of energy uh, and the higher your score, it was going to have a score multiplier. But that's not something that we could implement. It was, it, yeah, it's not, and especially visually, that's like another thing that we had to do with quality because screen tearing uh, was an issue, uh, particularly with the scrolling background that we have. I don't know if you noticed that the scrolling background like moved. Uh, if you move uh, the scrolling background at specific speeds and the asteroids at another specific speeds, then it just starts tearing and it just looks weird. Uh, there's creates an optical illusion and, and, and we just play and play until we had like, okay, this is something that I could do for hours and enjoy myself. Good. So um, this is, as you guys are well aware, it's complex, right? And there's a lot of moving parts. So I would, I would suggest that um, if you do something like this again, that it's complex, try to think how you can put it into autonomous little testable pieces so that you're not testing the whole thing, right? You, so sometimes it takes a little bit more code but you can move faster once once you figure out the pieces to the puzzle. Yes, yes, I definitely understand what you're saying. Uh, the thing is that you, uh, Unity, uh, there's something that, that at least I did with testing. Unity allows you, you can make variables and scripts uh, public and you are able, so what we did when we wanted to test something specific, you're able to toggle off all the scripts and test one specific thing. That's, that's something that, that we did a lot. If I just want to test if the energy asteroids are being deployed as they should, if they have enough mass, so we just uh, activate the energy script and that alone and test that. So yes, we, we would do that, but we just use Unity for that. But yeah, I understand what you mean. I think we have a question from our awesome guest from the virtual Zoom meeting. Yes. We have one. Um, uh, Natalia says, great job from your experience based on this final project. What would you say be an ideal time to design a video game? Like how much time is that? If you didn't have a deadline, how much time do you think you need to build? That's a, tough, that's a tough one. <laughs> I mean, okay, answering both. If you have the time to make a game, I would suggest that you put as much time and effort as you can. It's the other way around. If you didn't have a four week deadline, which is your final project deadline, and you wanted to do this video game with all the features and everything that you couldn't do because you had four weeks, how much time would it have taken to build the whole thing? I think that's what she wants to do. I mean, realistically, yeah. if, if it, yeah, it will have taken a few months because months? to make it, not perfect, but as much as complete as every feature that we mentioned, the shooting, the leaderboards, make it online, make it mobile compatible, maybe a few months. Yeah. Agreed? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Tony. Uh, great job, guys. I thought it was really polished and um, really well done. So I have a question about, um, the assets that you guys use. So did you guys use uh, components that were available online or did you have to do some pieces that were custom? Yes, uh, Unity has a very, um, um, as called an asset store. Uh, there are things that are open source that you can, uh, that you can use. Uh, and yes, that's where we, we started with, uh, you know, we're, with our MVP, we wanted to have things work. Uh, we, and so first, if we wanted to like change something about the aesthetics later, that's something that you could change once everything was working. 
Uh, but yeah, we we use the Unity uh, the Unity asset store and download uh, uh, download the assets from there, including the music that you didn't hear. But then <laughs> it was, was a, it was a nice song anyway. Yeah. So yeah. And you guys are um, I, I'm a UX guy, user experience type of person, and I noticed that uh, you guys have little bits that were uh, quite nice and surprises, like when the when the spaceship crashes into an asteroid, I notice that it rotates a little bit. So can you tell us a little bit about how you guys decide on some of those little type of uh, interactions? Yes, yeah, so, well, uh, this for the, for the, when the, the ship doesn't rotate, uh, it's a particle effect that's added to the ship as soon as the, so, you use a coroutine. Um, there's another, a whole nother script, which is the, the big script called the game manager. And it manages everything in the game, your lives, you know, the, the respawn and everything. And that script, uh, whenever the ship actually collides with, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a function unit called on collision, enter 2D. So on, upon detection of a collision, then the effect plays and we disable the game object. So uh, just a quick question. You um, talked about, you know, how you work together. I was wondering, uh, did you guys use like GitHub issues or how did you track like who was working on what? We communicated via Discord. We wrote, you know, and each time we came, you know, we came, yeah. We did with the change logs. And each time we came, uh, we came here to the school, we communicated what we were doing, what we have done, and what we should update. We also had our own Trello board available, which was basically covering everything everybody was doing. Uh, we had our own cards set up with the members, and Jeff was there to monitor it, to check up on us, on what we were doing. The, the tasks were divided on the Trello board, so we used Trello to keep track of what everybody was doing. Cool. Um, you guys said the build target was WebGL, right? Cool. Um, did you get any exposure to the URP feature in Unity for this project? Excuse me? Did you get any exposure to the URP functionality of Unity for this project? No. Okay, cool. Um, and then my second question is WebGL related. So WebGL creates a ton of strain on the memory of the browser. Did you guys worry about performance optimizations for this build? And if you did, what would you do in the future, provided you had time to make the game more performant for a variety of different browsers? Sure. Uh, regarding um, memory consumption uh, and, you know, and performance strain, uh, as you uh, I'm explaining with the asteroid script that we really limited the amount of assets that were on screen at any one time. So as soon as the asteroids that were generated uh, went out of bounds, they self-destroyed. So the amount of assets that were on screen at any one time were very small. Uh, also, uh, for the rolling background, it's the same image looping, uh, looping over again. Uh, it's a simple quad. Uh, so it loops uh, using offset. So it's very memory, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very memory efficient. So very, uh, very little things uh, that that were some of the things that that did consume a lot of memory that we could have done uh, a bit better uh, was uh, we use a very expensive uh, for the respawn. We use a very expensive expensive function that we could definitely improve. Uh, it was a fine object by type, which is something that, but we only ever use it when you die. So that's fine. Got it. Thank you very much. Awesome work, by the way. Thank you. One more question. One more question. Hi, sorry. One more. Um, can you guys tell me a little bit about how you made your decision to go with Unity instead of Unreal? <laughs> Actually, actually, Victor, uh, look at me like, uh, yeah, he was old team on real. Uh, in my, okay, so in my opinion, uh, we, uh, I think we use Unity mo um, mostly because of, of the resources. And on real, I mean, like Unity is still, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of still, you know, as clunky as it is, it's still 
user friendly compared to Unreal. Just you know, Unreal is really really harsh. <laughs> so I think that's that. Awesome. Thank you. Amazing job, guys. Uh, so you see, making a video game is not as, as easy as it looks, right? There's a lot of effort. Um, effort and hard work put into that project, right? Um, now, before we continue, I would like to give a special shout out to the guys in the back. We have the cohort 19 that has been... <laughs> It's been, it's been a very busy week and cohort 19 has been amazing helping us out with the setup. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is the first time that we're uh, doing, can, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes, okay. Um, so it was, you know, setting up the screen, the, the speakers, everything that being very helpful with that. Also, we have the guys from C cohort, cohort 20 we, who started like a few weeks ago, their, their journey here at the school. Oh, keep an eye because in a few months you'll be here too, okay? <laughs> and also we have alumni who are currently working in the industry. People, uh, uh, students that are currently doing their specialization are here present supporting their peers, okay? Uh, we strive in our community and we like to support each other. That is uh, something that we value a lot, okay? Um, so yes, without further ado, now let's go move on to the, the last presentation. And he is a student that is doing the specialization on AR VR, and he's going to present a specialized. Please come, Christopher. Hello there. I'm a big Star Wars fan, so I always loved it when Obi Wan would just pop up and be like, "Hello there." <laughs> uh, good afternoon. So it's just me, my lonely self here. Uh, I worked on this project alone. So let me start off with a question right off the bat. Have you guys, okay, like AR, VR, that's augmented reality, virtual reality. Let me make that declaration right. Um, have you guys ever wondered what it would be like to interact in a room, but in a virtual space? If the answer is no, don't worry. I'm here to change your mind on it. Um, so, First off, let's, let me introduce myself. My name is Christopher Soriano Principe because I have a mother. Um, I'm a full stack software engineer. And well, after this presentation, I'm gonna be an AR VR specialist. Uh, talking about a little bit of my background, uh, like one of my peers, I also started out uh, studying video game design and development in the Interamericana uh, in uh, Recinto de Bayamón. Uh, unfortunately, due to some unforeseen circumstances, I had to leave that bachelor's degree behind uh, and start in the work industry, particularly uh, as a warehouse worker. Uh, I went around a lot, worked for Amazon in a fulfillment center. I worked for a place called Central Drug here in Puerto Rico for almost two years, where after almost two years, I was laid off for no reason. And that just kind of like gave me the motivation to pursue something different and go back into my first love, which was the tech industry, right? So that's pretty much when I discovered Holverton. And I finished my foundations curriculum along the way, um, since I performed particularly well. Well, I was also became a student tutor. So at the same time that I was studying here, I was also helping other students with their projects and any doubts, concerns that they had, I would be there to help them. Um, so I finished my foundations curriculum, like I said, and shortly a few weeks after that, I started my specialization and like about three months in, uh, I, I landed a job at Lockheed Martin where, um, uh, <laughs> thank you, where currently um, I'm holding a position as a full stack engineer. Uh, by the way, shout out to Pedro Nieves, which is over there, site manager for the Aguadilla site. So uh, no pressure, right? <laughs> so yeah, uh, that's basically my story. 
Uh, moving on, let's talk about the problem. Well, not the problem per se, but kind of like give you a layout of what's going on. So VR, right? VR is a new technology. Uh, not a lot of people have uh, adopted it yet. So maybe due to fear, maybe due to something unknown, but VR is something that not a lot know how to handle because they don't know what the, it's capable of. They're unsure of how it works. And well, also, you can also add to that the, the fact that VR can be pretty overwhelming for some people. It introduces a couple of health concerns such as motion sickness and, and the likes. And that mainly detracts from people kind of adopting this technology, right? So to give you a personal story of mine, right? I got a Quest 2 because obviously, you know, I'm, I'm developing for it. So when I first got the Quest 2, um, I found it to be a little overwhelming when I put on the headset for the first time. I was like seeing menus all over the screen. I was like, whoa, what is this, right? So it's definitely an overwhelming experience. And it's something that hopefully with this app that I built uh, will help along the way, like ease that transition, right? That, that new experience. So here's my pitch. Uh, my project is called Specialized. It's kind of like a play on words because it's my specialization project. So Specialized. It's a VR app that's kind of like an educational experience with a guided tour, right? So basically what you're gonna see is a room and there's a bunch of objects that you can interact with and you're kind of like learning the different things that you can do in VR. How do you move around? How do you rotate the camera and how you pick up an object and you can just like rotate around, just like discover that that aspect, the, those things that you can accomplish in VR, right? So um, I wanted to do this experience. I wanted to make it easy to understand. I wanted to make it immersive for the user. So I worked on a lot of components for this app. And again, it was just me. So I worked on the lighting. I worked on the sounds. I worked on the interactions. And I really wanted to give the user the, like the full experience. So hopefully by the end of this, when you're trying that, that app out, it'll be something that it's like easy to understand, but it'll be memorable and enjoyable, right? So uh, without further ado, right? Um, Got a little demo, video demo set up. Yep. So uh, yeah, this is the room that I built. Um, basically, you can see like there's a UI section in here. Uh, you can click on it to go to different kinds of the, the menu, right? Um, you can teleport to spaces, pick up objects. Uh, that's a switch, yeah. <laughs> you can pick up the switch. You can separate like the Joy-Con controllers and you can switch it around just like you would on a normal Switch console, right? You can even turn it on. Uh, no, you can't play Animal Crossing on this VR app. It's just a video. Uh, that's a TV remote, right? So if you activate it, it'll actually turn on the TV and you can watch an episode of your favorite series. So... <laughs> So those are like some of the interactions that you can have with the, with the objects that you can find in this room. Um, another kind of object is kind of like that frame that I'm picking up there, right? So normally when you pick up a frame, you can do something with it, right? You can hang it up in the wall or something. So yeah, that's definitely something that you can do in this room too. You can pick up that other frame over there and rearrange it if you don't like where it is. Um, so here we have this box and the box was actually hiding a key. <laughs> and that's kind of like a, mini game of this app, right? Uh, if you read through the start, uh, there's kind of like a introduction. It says that you got to find a key so you can get out of the room. But uh, you find a key and you say it says that there's actually more content to come. So that's basically that's basically my MVP, right, for, for this project. So, let me talk about the design, right? Because this is something really important to me. The room that you saw there is a room based on my bedroom in real life. And 
you can see the comparison pictures um, side by side. The left one is my actual bedroom. Uh, the right side is the one that I built in VR. So you can see that I built the bed, I built the nightstand, the doggy stairs. <laughs> uh the the like even the colors i tried to mimic it as close to reality as possible so that kind of like if you know what it looks like in real life and you put that headset on it'll be like whoa is this real or is this like the virtual <laughs> kind of like get that get you that confused feeling right because it's so close to reality um another part of the, the room, right, with the mirror, even the console, with the numbers for the temperature that I prefer, 62. <laughs> uh, so yeah, moving on. There's the TV with the Switch. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to build that PS5. Um, but yeah, you can see the Switch and the TV and just like having that socket there so you can hang stuff in it. Uh, it was something that I also did for, for this app. So uh, talking about the development a little bit now. So start starting with the timeline. Uh, I had three weeks to develop this app and it wasn't new technology per se to me because it was something that I worked on previously, but still it was pretty challenging to have that time frame, right? So I kind of went and built this three week development plan where week by week, I would do like a sprint and I would focus on one concept, uh, one part of the app, right? At the end of the week, I would hold myself accountable uh, and kind of like do a retro on what went right, what went wrong and how I can improve on that the next week. Uh, by the third week, I scrapped this idea <laughs> kind of because I had, uh, a moment I had a, like a Eureka because what you saw there wasn't the original version of this app. What it was previously, it was just like a basic room, like a common room. It was just like no, no personal attachment to that project, right? And so that's why I kind of felt like I needed to change the design a little bit. And that's when I decided, hey, you know what? I'm not really good at designing stuff, but I want to recreate my room. I want to recreate something that is already there, but recreate it in a virtual space. So that's kind of like when I decided to make that change in the design and in the third week, well, I was able to accomplish that. <clears throat> so uh, you can scan that code, but it'll basically take you to a series of dev blocks that I wrote in LinkedIn. It'll talk and give a lot of detail into the development process everything that I did, did starting from week one to week three. It'll talk about how I worked on the lighting and how I optimized the app. It'll show you like a video demo uh, showing the, the progress week by week, right? So like I said, text used. Uh, I also use Unity and C Sharp for the scripting. Um, also, I, I, for Unity, I wanted to specify that I use uh, the XR plugin management, OpenXR plugin, XR interaction toolkits. All of those are built into Unity. And like the name says, it's just a toolkit. It helps me develop VR apps specifically for any, any kind of VR headset. So looking back and looking forward, what I learned from this project? Um, well, first of all, I wanted to make uh, a statement, right? I don't think there's such a thing as failures. I just think they're just learning opportunities, right? So a lot of learning went into this short amount of time, right? Like I said, I, I knew about the technology previously, but still I didn't, making this like a personal project I wanted to make sure that every kind of detail was as close to reality as possible. And that really pushed me to learn more about every component, every aspect of VR. So also one of the successes for me was that I was able to pivot from my original idea and still come through with an MVP on time, right? 
So like I mentioned, like I started with an idea and by the third week, I basically scrapped that and switched out the design, but I was still able to complete the project on time. So that was a really big win for me. And also the fact that at the end, I kind of did feel like I completed my vision for the project. So some things that I feel like I could learn from this and that I will apply to any future BR project or any project really is that spend less time planning, more time doing. I know that sounds kind of crazy because planning is an essential part of any project, but in my case, it would have really helped a lot if I would just would have started doing something and then realized along the way, hey, I'm not feeling really happy about this. So let me just change it, right? And that would have saved me some time and maybe kind of implement more components into the room or maybe expand upon the space. Also, I would say that picking a topic that you feel passionate about really helps because doing projects like this is very demanding. It's, it's very taxing to the mind, right? So if you pick something that you feel passionate about, you're just gonna find the determination to keep going. And also really important to make, make the time for learning every day. We're in the tech, we, we are in the tech industry and this industry isn't like a, I finish this curriculum and that's it, you know? It's like, it's always evolving, it's always changing. So it's always good to uh, stay on top of the new things that are popping up, right? Yeah. So as far as the future of the project, <laughs> this is really funny, actually. At the end of the project, at the end of my MVP, I actually found the floor plans to the house. And that would have helped me out a lot <laughs> during my development, because my way to go with this project, I would just use a ruler and I would like take that and I would measure it each dimension so that I could translate it into the project, right? But, but having this floor plan would have really helped out. So as you can see on the left side is the floor plan on the right side, it's kind of like a screenshot of the Unity editor and what I have built up so far. And you can kind of see the similarities in the walls, the placements, it's all measured to scale. And if you look on the floor plan where next to the master bedroom, it says bedroom. That is the space that I had built for the MVP. So you can kind of see like this new space that I'm building is like more than twice the space that I presented. But given that, uh, that's pretty much it for my presentation. Um, I wanted to make the, I also wanted to state out that if any of you guys are interested, I have the Quest 2 right there. So you can test out the app and you can live the experience. <laughs> Good play. All right. So let's go for a round of questions starting here. Well, uh, once again, excellent job. Uh, I don't really have a question. I just want to mention that I, and recognize that I, that I think it's really brave and, and to uh, congratulate you into um, no, being aware of the progress of creating something and have the courage to step back and rethink the process and, and restart doing something that really it's, uh, no, that, that we end up being, uh, no, the, what do you, uh, uh, for the, um, was ambitioning for the project. So uh, that takes a lot of courage and, and, and emotional intelligence. So uh, congratulations, congratulations and uh, excellent job. Thank you. Hello, um, like, like he said, you did a great job. Um, my question for you is, um, so you're a specialist in AR, VR. Why did you choose a VR project or an AR project? And um, as a developer, what are the main differences in the developer experience when building AR versus VR projects? So I decided to make a VR app mainly because I wanted to focus on the question. I knew, I knew from the start going into the specialization that between AR and VR, I wanted to focus on the VR aspect of it because 
a while back before I jo joined the specialization, I had an experience with uh, VR, um, like a, a machine that was kind of like a VR experience. And so I went through that and I was like, whoa, this is really immersive. I want to build that. I want to build that experience for, for everybody else, you know? So I always knew that I wanted to do a VR experience for my final project. As far as the differences for AR and VR, I know that AR is more accessible at the moment because you're probably going to find more people with smartphones than a VR headset, right? Um, but still, um, I believe that the VR market is on the rise and um, there's going to be more headsets on, on the hands of people. So that's, that's my uh forecast for the future <laughs> gracias great job so um a couple technical questions around possible challenges um tell me a little bit about that the lighting and the choices in the lighting the shades to make a more natural experience did you got that deep or you kind of went with what you had because you were running out of time lighting is wow it was so annoying i'm gonna be honest yeah. it was the last thing that i worked but you know what it was really worth it because it is the most performance demanding thing of the project mm -hmm. right because in unity it works with real-time lighting and for the processor that's that's really taxing mm -hmm. so if you want your vr app to be running up op up optimally, mm -hmm. then you need to optimize that lighting. So I use what they call baked in lighting, mm -hmm. where I would set up, I set up inside of the, the room, a light probe group, and it just kind of told it, okay, I want you in this particular part of the room, I want you to take notes of how the light lighting would affect that object, right? Mm -hmm. So I built that group and based on that, I baked in the lighting. So basically there's no real time lighting anymore. So the performance for that was freed up so that the app can run smoothly and you don't have like that jarring, like feeling when you're moving around and kind of like lagging behind the image. Mm -hmm. So that, that still, it was, it was really stressing for me, but it worked out in the end and um, I'm proud of it. It looks it looks pretty close to how my room looks like in in reality. Very cool. Very cool. So, uh, you were talking about jittering. So I assume you had screen buffering, but still you you have that jittering. Sorry, could you repeat did that? you do screen buffering to address no, some of no? No, I didn't work with the screen buffering. I did optimize it by using like for example the wall colors, uh -huh. instead of using different colors, I would use the same color for various objects because Unity renders it in a way that it'll try to be like smart. Mm -hmm. So if I use the same element for various objects, it'll render them at the same time. And so mm -hmm. that'll free time for when it's uh, performing, when, when it's building and when it's like running. Okay, All right. Um... Changing topics, geometry of your objects. Uh, <laughs> tell me, when did you say, okay, that, that looks real enough? So, yeah, uh, I decided to do something that every game developer or any world, when any world building is supposed to be involved, I use cube building. So all of that room was built basically with a cube model, just stretched out in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. I decided to do it that way because I wanted to focus on the interaction first and mm -hmm. then the models, because then I would need to make a polygon object out of every mm -hmm. object, right? And that takes a lot of time. So I decided to, yeah, cute model everything. And one of the things that I'm particularly proud of is that switch because <laughs> it looks blocky, but everything works so right. You can take it and you can like, and you have, you have both of the joy cons, right? You can take one joy con out, you can put it on the other side. It plays, you know, it's it's like everything. You can even dock it. So that that, that was something that I'm really proud of. <laughs> Good. Good. So now um, a comment in one of your, your observations, right? One of, one of the learnings in areas of opportunity where you mentioned uh, spend less time planning, right? Um, 
I, I, I think planning is, is important. Uh, over planning is not a good idea, right? So would, would, you, would you agree or disagree that you were planning too far into the future, or probably planning multiple times, planning once a week would have been better or no planning, planning at all? No, I would, I would not say no planning. There is some planning that needs to be involved, but me particularly, I know myself. Mm -hmm. I, I know that sometimes I overthink things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, definitely, I, I looked ahead and I was like, I want it to be this way and that way and whatever, I wanna include this, but that I didn't think about something else. And I was just so focused on what I wanted to look like in the end, I didn't focus on how it should look like now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I definitely, I definitely did over plan. And maybe if I would have planned it in more like uh, more frequent, but less intense, mm -hmm. it would have really helped out. Yeah. Yeah, I recommend that. I recommend that approach. <laughs> right. That's it. Cool. Hey, Christopher, I have someone that uh, sends a message and has a question. She says, great job. Uh, you're a very good pu public speaker and you're very engaging. Uh, she's also asking, you mentioned that in your improvements, you would have chosen something that you're passionate about. What is something that you're passionate about and that you could use your knowledge from this project to showcase that passion using this technology? Right. So I wanted that, yeah, that improvement, I wanted to, it was like a comment on how my project started out being so basic, being like common, you know, it wasn't personal to me. So when I made the change to make it be a part of my house, make it be a room, that's when it got personal for me. And that's kind of like when I started to make sure that every kind of detail was, was right. So that's what I refer to, pick a topic that you're passionate about, right? And I also noticed that during development, I like building. <laughs> I'm not a good designer, but I, I like building worlds, right? So if I took something that already exists and it's just a matter of translating into a virtual space, I really enjoy that. So I would say that that is something that I'm passionate about, right? Designing, I'm, I'm gonna be a designer, something I didn't like, <laughs> but yeah. Question from, from the back, anyone before we proceed? Good, okay, so thank you, Christopher. So I, I definitely agree with Christopher. Um, the best way to know if you like something is to dive your hands into it, right? And get involved with it, experiment with it. That's, and you discover new things, things that you, might have thought that you didn't like right and of course vr is bringing this new, new technology is bringing new experiences to us the way we we see our world the way we experiment with it and also wow. AR. so thank you christopher for uh, presenting your project um so that that was our last presentation uh, from our, our for today for the demos um, as you can see there are students with different backgrounds uh, they come from psychology service industry uh, different interests, right? But they all have one thing in common. They like uh, technology, they're passionate about it. And if one, thi one thing is true is that technology uh, is part of our everyday life and it becomes more uh, attached to us uh, as years go by and we start living differently uh, with technology around us, right? <laughs>